Good evening. Welcome to the uh, 29th Emeriti Lecture with uh, Adrian Zillman, professor, distinguished professor of anthropology uh, emerita. I'm Todd Whipke, president of the Emeriti Association, uh, which is a group of retired faculty and it represents the interests of the retired faculty uh, and promotes and encourages continued productive uh, scholarly research after retirement. We provide uh, two, uh, two lectures to the community that are public lectures. Uh, this, is, this is one of them. There'll be another in April. They occur on the second Tuesday of April and November. Lectures are free and open to the public, and they're recorded and uh, available on YouTube, as are our luncheon lectures, which occur every other month. Every three years, uh, the Emeriti Association does a survey to determine what activities the Emeriti are, have done for the past three months. And this is a reminder to any Emeriti in the audience, if you haven't uh, submitted your survey, please do so. The, the survey is coming to a close uh, very shortly. We also have a newsletter that you might find interesting, and uh, it's, it's a quarterly newsletter available on our website under newsletters. Uh, our website is emeriti.ucsc.edu, and it has stories by emeriti, so those of you not retired can see what emeriti are doing and uh, what they find interesting. After the lecture, we'll have questions uh, followed by refreshments uh, in the lobby. I'd like to thank the chancellor for financially supporting this uh, Emeriti lecture and also Alicia who supported, who provided uh, organizational support to help make this uh, come to pass. Please, of course, take care of your cell phones uh, so that it doesn't get recorded along with the lecture. And now I would like to ask Professor Emerita uh, of Politics, Isabel Ronnie Grun, uh, to introduce our speaker, Professor Zoman. Uh, Ronnie today at 10 o'clock gave a rousing lecture to about 250 people on immigration and trade as a part of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute classes that she uh, is very successful at uh, presenting and is a, an, another example of how emeriti contribute to the community after retirement. Ronnie? So the first reasonable question you might ask, what's a professor of international politics doing introducing a physical anthropologist? Uh, let me say that Adrian and I both came to this campus in the late 60s, in the days when there were almost no women on the faculty. There were just a handful of us. And amongst those few women faculty, several were seniors to us. So not surprisingly, early on, um, we all knew who we were. Um, and I'd like to say a couple of things about those early days and then go talk about Adrian. Uh, in those days, people taught five courses. Uh, they taught, at least in the humanities and social sciences. And they um, did not get course reductions like junior faculty get nowadays. Uh, we um, had some large classes, unlike uh, folks believe today that we all had teeny little classes in those early days. 
There were essentially no graduate students, so we had to read our own student exams and papers, even if there were 100 students. And in those days, there weren't any grades, and so we had to write written evaluations. I say all of this not to say, oh, we felt sorry for ourselves. In fact, we enjoyed ourselves. But rather to say that in the midst of a very heavy teaching load, we then also had an administrative load. By the early 70s, it became fashionable to say Senate committees of various kinds, academic planning, educational policy, and so forth, maybe they should at least have one woman on them. So those of us few stray women around were constantly on committees. And in those days, committees uh, actually did a fair amount of academic management. Unlike today, where you often have highly paid administrators who in turn hire uh, consultants to lay out academic plans, we were expected to do those sorts of things. I say this all as by way of prologue to say, I'm imagining that faculty who came, let's say in the 80s, 90s, and beyond, find it hard to believe that given what it looked like to be a faculty here in the early days and to be a female faculty here in the early days, that anybody got any research done. But in point of fact, Adrian is a very good case in point of someone who did a hell of a lot of research and became both nationally and internationally famous for her research. So A, it could be done in general, and B, lots of kudos for Adrian to have accomplished that. Now, <laughs> let me tell you one story before I leave this podium. Um, a friend of ours, um, who is no longer amongst us, got the bright idea to have a barbecue at the end of the summer for a few of us who had spent the summer doing research in Africa. I was one of them, Adrian was another, and John Markham was a th third. So we had a barbecue and we were asked to bring slides of our summer research. I had done research substantially in Ethiopia where Adrian and John had not as yet spent a lot of time. But of course, I, bore, I interviewed boring bureaucrats, right? International bureaucrats, not very scenically worthwhile to show slides. So instead, I showed slides about the beauty of the landscape in Ethiopia, which indeed in many ways looks like the Grand Canyon in portions, as well as the very handsome people in the markets and so forth. Next up was John Markham. He was working on a second volume of Angola. Angola in the early 70s was still a colony. And he had joined one of the guerrilla groups who were fighting for dominance when independence came. And he showed mind-boggling pictures of him going through the natural environment with these heavy armed forces with Kalashnikovs on their backs and so forth and told horror and details about how they had gotten attacked. He even showed some victims of gunshots and he said very dramatically he was really, really lucky to have gotten out of there alive to be able to write a second volume. Next came Adrian. Onto the screen came Bones. This kind of bone, that kind of bone, multiple bones, small bones, large bones. And Adrienne was just as animated about her bones as John had been about the horrors of the guerrilla conflict and my enthusiasm about the nature in Ethiopia. And I tell you this because one of the hallmarks of Adrienne has been her deep and enthusiastic engagement with her research throughout her career and as we now learn past her retirement. Many faculty get bored with their subject matter, they get bored um, even teaching it towards the end of their career and often abandon their area of interest in retirement and do something else. Adrienne is a good example of someone who was an enthusiast when she was a young assistant professor and who is still an enthusiast for her subject today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Adrienne.
Good evening, and thank you for that um, introduction, Ronnie. Ronnie and I have been on this campus together for many years and um, have been great friends and someone who's wonderful non-humor I've enjoyed. <laughs> so I want to begin by introducing you to the cast of characters that I'm going to talk about. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, there are four major groups, uh, beginning on the left with the gibbon and siamangs. These are the small apes that brachiate and they move swiftly through the trees. They live mainly in Southeast Asia and uh, consist of about 15 species. They're the smallest of the apes, five to 15 uh, kilograms. The next one is the uh, orangutan. These are the, the large red apes where, uh, are from Borneo and Sumatra, although they used to be widespread even into southern China. Uh, they live strictly in the trees, uh, weigh as some of the females are 50 kilograms, but the males can be over 100 kilograms, and they, almost, they don't, never leave the trees. They're really strictly tree livers. Uh, the next group is are the gorillas. These are um, there are two species. The mountain gorilla that's well known uh, due to uh, the popular film from days ago, from decades ago of uh, gorillas in the mist. Uh, that we know, we know the mountain gorillas well. There are many fewer of them, but the larger population is in Central Africa, and these are the lowland western gorillas. Um, they, are, they go over uh, 70, 80 kilograms for the females and 200 kilograms for the males. And uh, finally, the chimpanzees that we all know and love because we identify so much, they look like us. We sort of see them, we see ourselves in them, I think, or they probably see us in them. Uh, there are two species of chimpanzee, uh, one panpaniscus, the pygmy chimp or the bonobo, and the other species, pan troglodytes, that uh, consists of uh, three or four subspecies. The chimpanzees are uh, distributed all the way across equatorial Africa and are the widest spread single, single genus. I'll just point out to you that um, these are all females that are are inter, that I'm introducing, but the males come later, so you will see examples of the males. Um, the thing about working on, on apes is that they are all threatened or in danger these days, mainly due to habitat destruction. In some cases, they're hunted for meat. Um, and this is really a great tragedy when we know so little about their anatomy. All of the apes, uh, the major groups of apes have now been sequenced. Uh, their genomes have been sequenced. They've been, their genetics are being widely studied. Uh, there are a lot of field sites, uh, field research going on, learning about their life history, ecology, uh, and social dynamics. Uh, and there are also wonderful studies going on in captive apes. But what's missing is our knowledge, our detailed knowledge um, about their bodies, about their physical beings. And I think of what a tragedy it would be to lose them before we really understand all the things that we need to, to learn about them. Um, we know a lot about their dentition. We know a lot about their skulls. They're studied uh, a lot to be compared with early fossils, so we know what our ape relatives look like. There's not a lot uh, of work on the soft anatomy, the tissues, the skin, the bones, and so the skin and muscle. Um, and there's very little done on the whole entire animal. Uh, so we, and we don't have comparable information on all of the different kinds of apes that we can really use the same kind of information to compare across, uh, across the species in terms of, of the soft anatomy. One of the things that we have to keep in mind is that natural selection operates on the whole organism. This was what Darwin wrote about in the 19th century. 
And therefore, the knowledge about the whole individual, the whole body, is what's really evolving and adapting, and that's what we really need to understand. So uh, when I came to Santa Cruz, um, originally, um, anatomy was not my major focus. I mainly was working on fossils and bones, as Ronnie says, and that was very exciting. Uh, but I did, I had always done some kind of comparative anatomy, so in those days, social sciences did not have any laboratories. But the university was very accommodating, and they built me a very large black table for my dissections. They got me a little freezer, and I had some scalpel blades and rubber gloves and a lab coat, and I was good to go. So um, I continued some of my smaller animals. I taught some comparative anatomy classes. Um, but I always maintain that interest to want to know what's inside the animal, what's, or what's on top of the bones, that, all the three dimensions uh, about anatomy. And actually, my interest in looking inside things came about from the time I was a small girl when I spent uh, part of every summer since I was six years old with my grandma Zillman, my Ada, Ada Zillman, a real pioneer woman who made all of her food and had gardens and chickens and, you know, the whole nine yards. And so when she prepared chicken for dinner, she would go out. My grandfather would sharpen the knife, uh, but she would kill the chicken and take it apart. And I would stand there and watch her as she took out the insides. And I would say, Grandma, what's this? And she would tell me what it was and tell me what it did. And I never lost that fascination with wanting to know uh, what's going on besides uh, just the external part of the anatomy. Well, I was here for 27 years before I finally did get a laboratory. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and the lab opened in Social Science One in 1994. That was an incredibly wonderful year uh, for Diane, Judith, and Allison, and myself, where we had our labs on the fourth floor. We also had a large teaching lab equipped with a sink and all the accoutrements. Uh, but mainly, we had a large walk-in freezer and a freight elevator. Uh, and uh, my cultural anthropology colleagues wondered, why on earth do we need a freight elevator in a social science building? Because in those days, it was going to be anthropology and economics. Well, if the truth be told, I was on the building committee. As Ronnie said, we were on committees. And uh, so I was considered the expert for anthropology. I think Don Massaro was there for psychology. And um, I wanted, uh, I had a secret desire always to have a large silverback male gorilla sometime in my future. But I always wanted to make sure that if that ever happened, that I would have the facilities in order to deal with him. So... Let me get on with the rest of the story. So um, the way that um, for a lot of my research was on bones, on skeletons, and one of the exciting projects I worked on was with Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall is very familiar, I'm sure you all know of her work, and uh, starting in 1960, she started working on these animals and followed them throughout their lives, but she was, uh, Jane Goodall doesn't always get a lot of credit for being the fabulous scientist that she was, because what she realized is that even after the animals die, that they have a lot to tell us. So she saved, she always tried to find the animals if they died, uh, when they died, if, if they were sick, she could maybe watch them. And in this way, when I teamed up with her, we were able to connect 
events that happened in their lives. And I remember she knew the, the age and sex, the individuals. She knew what happened to them over the years. That we were able to connect things about their life that we could then read in the skeleton. And so this is, was really encouraging for thinking about uh, looking at a fossil record. Then I continue that interest in looking at uh, skeletons of known age and sex animals with Christoph Busch, whose field site was in the Ivory Coast uh, in the Thai forest, and published two papers with him. The second one was on, uh, that I mentioned here on uh, skeletal dental growth, was with a former stu student, actually my first and only graduate student, Deborah Bolter, who taught me about growth and development. So when we looked at the, uh, these individuals of known ages and sex, she developed really great methodology that we could really make some, some breakthroughs on that. But 1994 was great for another reason, not f at least from my point of view. And, and that is that Buana, the prize gorilla at the San Francisco Zoo, died. He was 36 years old, which is really a pretty good life for a gorilla. Uh, he was obviously beloved by all of the Bay Area people. I certainly knew him from the time I came to graduate school at Berkeley. So he was really a fixture, and we loved him. Now, I got a, when he died, it was Labor Day weekend. And I got a call early Saturday morning from a colleague from San Jose State, uh, Bob Germain. And he knew of my interest in anatomy, and he's, he called me up to tell me that Buana had died and he really wanted me to try to get the animal for my study because he knew I'd be interested. So I made phone calls, made contact. You know, this is before uh, cell phones and all that kind of thing. We just finally, I got in touch with the zoo and was able to get permission to uh, do the soft tissue and then return the skeleton to the California Academy of Sciences where he now is. Now the problem is he weighed uh, 380 pounds, 172 kilograms, and the problem was how do I get him to Santa Cruz? Now this is Labor Day weekend, so my husband and I drove my Honda Accord out to the zoo. I thought maybe I could put him on the roof or <laughs> take out the back seat or, you know, somehow. Uh, but um, I wanted to make sure that I, you know, a bird in the hand, you know, you really want to get there. So. Uh, but I have friends, it's always nice to have friends, and Jeff Barbier and Robin McFarlane came to my rescue. Mainly Jeff's pickup truck came to the rescue, because Jeff as a contractor had a very nice big uh, a vehicle that would easily transport Buana. And Robin and I promised that we would clean it up if anything happened to it, and so... Uh, we hauled him on board, and Robin has this look like, what do we do now? So, um, now, this was before we had all the equipment, so we, the problem now is how do you get this into the freight elevator? So we found a piece of plywood, and we put him on this little meal cart, you know, and you can see we were all holding on so that we could get him into the elevator, Yes, thank God for that elevator. And then the trick was to get him in and out of the freezer. Now, we put him in because he had just been necropsied when we picked him up. But the trick was then to get him out because he had frozen and you couldn't get him through the door. Now, I was on the other side of that blue package uh, inside the freezer. And it was with a lot of maneuvering that we finally did... Um, get him out. Um, and I put in the um, Herb Cain column because for those of you who happen to be old enough to remember that Herb Cain was the big gossip columnist uh, for many years in San Francisco and of course he wrote about him and uh, made it into a very amusing column and mentioned that I had his body but that the bones were going to go to the Cal Academy. So you can see why I needed a proper lab for a large silverback male gorilla. 
that we begin our study by taking measurements. And you can see uh, Robin there wielding the instruments. Now, one of the wonderful things about this, just having these animals to work on, is that um, we engage the undergraduates because there were no graduate students, and I'm not sure they'd be interested anyway. And Robin, who was teaching human anatomy at Cabrillo, brought her students over. So we had the Cabrillo students and the Santa Cruz students, some of a number of which are in the audience here. And it was a real team effort, so we'd work really hard uh, uh, taking the animal apart. And the media center uh, in social sciences also would occasionally film. Occasionally, we had to have consultations on which structure we're looking at. Uh, another thing that we did, this is Carol Underwood, who, now this is really interesting, that showed a lot of foresight, because when you're taking apart an animal, it's really like a fleeting moment, because once you start dismantling it, it's not there anymore. And she was thinking ahead enough to take photographs, so we are very well photographed dissections. And we took handprints and footprints. And then when everything was all cleaned and measured, we photographed all the bones. So we got down to the bones. We would take breaks. This was one of the breaks we took while dissecting Buana. And then uh, another great year was 2003 when Carol Underwood transferred to Santa Cruz and uh, was going to finish her uh, undergraduate degree in anthropology, but she came also for the scientific illustration program. Now what happened the year that she came is that it went off campus. So I met her at orientation and she told me you know, how disappointed she was and I said, look, not to worry, I've got a whole lab full of bones, we've got dissections going, you come on up and you can do whatever you want. So in fact, that's what she did. And over the years, she became an incredibly skilled anatomist. And here she is with a number of the gibbon, skeleton, the, the gibbon skeletons of just partially the kinds of dissections that she did. And then we would clean the bones and measure them. Uh, and then she applied her artistic sensibility and her skill at art, artistic rendering and drew not only the bones but the muscles on top that were exactly like what was on the animal. So transferring all of that three-dimensional uh, material into a two-dimensional picture. And Vesalius would have been really proud of her. So after working together, we discovered that we had a lot in common because Carol also, she, I had my grandma Zillman farm in Iowa, and she grew up on a dairy farm in northern New York. So we had a lot in common. We had a passionate interest in anatomy. And around 2007, 2008, we started thinking about, gee, we really should start bringing all this anatomy together and put it together, and in the tradition of Vesalius, have it very well illustrated. So I'm happy to say that after 10 years that we're now doing the galley proofs of this book after uh, all of that effort, so it's very exciting. So you're gonna see some fabulous artwork by Carol, as well as, I must say, all of the good anatomy that she contributed. So I'm gonna go quickly through the methods because what's important about the way that we do anatomy uh, in order to really give it an evolutionary and a, com and a comparative uh, depth is we collect data quantitatively. We weigh and measure everything. And the way we do that is that when we take the body apart, we do one side uh, by dividing up the segments. You can see uh, on, I guess that's on your left. And then on the other side, we take off each muscle at a time. And in this way, it, with one individual, you can generate a tremendous amount of data. We also, of course, dissect the head and the trunk and so on. And we weigh, as I said, we weigh everything. And here's Robin weighing things. You can see our data sheets. So I'm going to give you an example now of how literally we take the animal apart. So we had a newborn gibbon. And uh, on one side, we took it apart by segments, the forelimb and hind limb. And then we did the segments of each of those limbs. Uh, and then, and weighed everything, of course, and then each segment was taken apart by muscle 
uh, skin, muscle, and bone, as you see, and that was weighed. So we had all of the tissue, all of the bones, all of the, and then, then we had the individual muscles. So here's the arm muscles, you see deltoid, skin's at the top, and uh, the humerus arm bone is at the bottom. The forearm, very complicated. This is the kind of work that Carol did, so you can really see what kind of skill that she brought to being able to, I was so impressed that those little muscles um, that she was able to take apart. Then, after we get all the data, we then analyze it in terms of body proportion, so you know how big the arms and legs are and how much the trunk is of total body weight. Body composition, the tissues, how much muscle, how much bone, how much skin, how much do the organs weigh, and so on, all of it. And then we can look at muscle groups, we can look at functional groups, and uh, the distribution of muscle throughout the body. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. And then we can what meant to, and then we can do some comparisons. We can compare animals of different body weight, different ages, different sexes, whatever. And so the analysis, for example, is the body proportions of the forelimbs and hind limbs. And the muscle analysis is an example of the uh, flexor and extensors of the, of the hand and fingers. So the, uh, the flexors, of course, close the hand, the extensors open the hand, and you can see that the flexors are almost four times the mass of, of the extensors. And so you can see how we can begin to then learn about function in, in this way. In comparison, for example, this is how we start comparing across the apes. Here's the example of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. Now, for any of you who've ever had any shoulder injury or a frozen shoulder, these are the muscles that are responsible. And so what we were able to do was to analyze that for all four of the groups, and you can see how similar they are And because the ape shoulder is a particularly unique to apes that we share and completely different from monkeys. So that's one of the things that we're picking up is that, wow, they're similar. Another interesting example is um, the hand, the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Uh, what you're looking at in the center is the orangutan hand, which has a very long palm and long fingers. It has the smallest thumb of all of the apes. And what we looked at were the three groups of muscles, the purple that, that operate the thumb and the hypothena at the other side and all the rest, the palm muscles. So there are three groups. And one of the, the findings, which was really a shock, is that the amount of muscle going to the thumb of the orangutan is as much as for the gibbon and, and more than for the chimpanzee and the gorilla that have longer thumbs. So one of the the things that we're learning is that you can't necessarily tell. Even if you had a whole hand skeleton, you wouldn't necessarily know how that muscle, what muscle went on it and how much. If we look at different ages, infants are not miniature adults, which I think that the artists of uh, the Renaissance finally got that. that and uh, the, the uh, infants have less m muscle, more bone and skin, And they have very heavy forelimbs and hind limbs because that's where a lot of the uh, hand and foot motions for hanging on to the mother. Uh, and we see that in, in the limbs. The trunk is what grows later. And then finally, the distribution of body muscle. And this is particularly useful for thinking about Uh, locomotion and some of the differences in the groups of apes. So uh, you can see the forelimb muscle, and you see the three out of the four are practically identical, the uh, gibbon, gorilla, and chimpanzee, and the orangutan is way more in the forelimb, way more muscle. And if you look at the hind limb, you kind of see a gradation with the chimpanzee having the most muscle and, a, and the orang, poor little orangs, have a lot less. So this is going to tell you something about orangutans, especially in terms of being a bit of an outlayer that we're going to see in their locomotion. And the gibbon is a pretty garden variety ape and not that different in some ways from gorillas and chimps. 
So I'm going to share just a, a few examples of what we found. And uh, I'm going to begin with just reminding one of the basic findings and why this whole animal research is so important is that three of the main tissues, muscle, bone, and skin, account for 65%, and I promise I wasn't going to say any numbers, but it's at least 65% of body weight, which means that this is what's underpinning our loco the locomotor system of apes. And that is going to give you clues then about how this particular 65% is distributed and some of the details gives you some idea about the uniqueness of each of the, of the apes. So we're back to the orange-red ape. These are uh, really interesting apes, Southeast Asia, big apes. They're the biggest animal that lives in trees. If you can imagine a hundred kilo uh, orangutan, and you see, and you do see one on the right. One of the things that is so interesting about their locomotion and therefore their anatomy is that they are so flexible that they use all of their limbs equally and can go under branches, over branches, and so on, because they rarely ever come to the ground, and they're not at all comfortable on the ground. Now, if you're living in the trees all the time, you have to occasionally cross gaps. So bridging behavior is really important, and you can see that it's a whole body action, and the long, heavy reach of those forelimbs, you can see that grabbing onto some leaves of the next tree, with very flexible joints. And if you look closely at the ankle joints, you see that the feet are going in opposite directions. Those ankles are so mobile that they have a firm grasp that then stabilize the animal. After we uh, have it dissected, we clean and measure. And the point that I would like to make here is that we measure the bones and look at the relative segments of, of the limbs. If, in particular, the hind limb, where you see the linear dimension where the foot is the longest part, and you saw that long foot that also extends the length of the hind limb, but the mass, over half of it, goes to the thigh. So this, for those of us who are interested in fossils, you really have to be careful about being able to understand what is going on to what is the soft tissue that's going on to those bones because it's not going to necessarily be told to us by the actual linear dimensions. Now, orangs are really interesting for a lot of reasons, but another from an anatomical point of view is that they have these uh, uh, big fat pads. We call them flanges. And uh, they're characteristic of the big honcho male orangutans but we didn't really know much about their structure. And uh, so when we got a, uh, an orang, um, my colleague, John Gerchi, you might know his work from uh, National Geographic. He does a lot of work on reconstructing early human fossils. And in the uh, Smithsonian exhibit on human evolution, he did all the sculptures and a lot of the artwork. So uh, John came to join in um, and one of the things that was really unusual is that those flanges actually are as broad as the shoulders. They're really, and they weigh, uh, in our dissection, we determined that they weigh two and a half kilograms. That's, you know, over five pounds. So you can imagine five pounds of flesh on your face. But uh, John then uh, took it apart by the facial muscles and you see his beautiful uh, drawing of that, he's an artist like Carol, uh, of the specific facial muscles, which is what his interest was. But he was able to show that that sheet of facial muscles actually go into those pads and enable them to possibly move a little. Maybe a working hypothesis is that maybe it vocalizes their vo uh, focuses their vocalizations that they give. The gorillas are, um, of course, the majestic giants of the forest, and we know and love them. This is a scene that Carol did that sort of represents kind of the feeling of the lowland western gorillas that uh, not only climb trees and are on the ground, but they also 
go into the buys or the swampy regions to feed on aquatic plants. And you see the silverback male uh, on the left front and on the other side is a female. Um, and uh, a former student, Melissa Remus, uh, went off to Central Africa Republic to study their locomotion, sex differences, diet, and so on. So we're very proud of her. She spent about five years in the field on and off. And one of the things that we learned about the lowland gorillas that we did not know from the mountain gorillas is that they're really good tree climbers. Even these 175 kilo males, and some of them reach over, over 200, are really, they can go 10, 20 meters up into the, to the trees to feed. They like the fruit up there and they're willing to do it. They're really strong and do it very easily. And the other thing that we learned from the field studies is that they like insects. Now we never associated gorillas with eating insects. We thought they ate leaves and, and herbs and that sort of thing. But what they do is um, just simply tear the termite nest away from the tree and then break it up into little pieces. And you can see he's even using his foot here, and sometimes they sit and brace their feet. And then just take it like a salt shaker, and, and Melissa demonstrated this for us when we were in the field. They just, the little larvae fall out, and that's their, their little snack. Um, we're beginning to understand that strength of the males because the sex differences are really remarkable in the uh, body proportions because the forelimbs and hindlimbs on the male, as you can see in blue, is considerably more than the females. So that kind of uh, strength, especially in the upper body, is uh, a hallmark and it helps you understand how they're able, given their big size, to still be so agile in the trees. Another interesting aspect of this is Kubi, who is Buana's offspring, by the way, from the San Francisco Zoo. And thanks to Joanne Tanner and Charles Ernest, who took this wonderful picture, they filmed uh, the San Francisco Zoo gorillas for over a period of about 10 years. And then Joanne also, I, I kind of claim that she's a former student too, uh, got her PhD at St. Andrews and has written several wonderful papers on uh, gestural communication and the origin of language. So one of the things that I like about this picture, aside from Kubi having his pumpkin at, at this time of year, but also uh, his, is I want you to see the profile of his head and notice that he has like a dome on the top of his skull. And what we always assumed is that that was just the bone and muscle that created the dome. It turns out, I called in John Gurchy again that helped us out with this dissection, and it turns out that that dome, as you see on the side profile at the bottom, is, is simply connective tissue. It's connective tissue and fat, and it's only found in the really uh, older males. It's a very diagnostic visual uh, clue, probably for the rest of the animals, and very, uh, distinct, a distinct structure that we had no idea about. Now, for those, if you go to the Cal Academy of Science or if you've been there lately, next time you go, and you go into Africa Hall, look on the left-hand side and you'll see the mountain gorilla diorama and it's a big male and he's really, really buff and muscular. But if you look at his head, he doesn't quite have the dome. And I puzzled about this for a long time. He doesn't quite look like a real male, and that's because the taxidermist was, was not privy to the fact that that's really soft tissue that's creating that really high head um, decoration that is found on these big silverbacks. So this is uh, some of the things. So we're going to turn to chimpanzees. Everybody loves chimpanzees. They're uh, so well known. They're distributed all the way across equatorial Africa from uh, Uganda, Tanzania in the east all the way to Senegal. And of course we know a lot about them because initially from Jane Goodall, but there are a lot of studies now going on. They're really, they live in really diverse set of habitats from savanna, every kind of woodland to lowland forest. Uh, and in some areas they actually go to about two or three thousand meters. Um, 
and you can see them doing all kinds of things in slightly more open kinds of habitat. And you see in the left a female at a termite hill. This is what Jane Goodall, one of her famous discoveries. Uh, here, pygmy chimpanzees, Pan paniscus, from one of the longest running uh, field sites in uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo by the Japanese. This is a group of females. Females are very affiliative, and if you look closely, you can probably see about five babies or offspring there. And they really like clumping together like a little nursery group. But there are males in the same group as well. As Then I'll show you again the Gombe chimpanzees. This was from Jane Goodall's um, uh, book cover, and the, you can see that the, char the main characteristics that are different is that it's the facial and the skull, we know that from the skull, but they also have a more robust, the troglodytes have a more robust body than, than does paniscus. So one of the really interesting things that, um, that we were able to find in the lab is the comparison of two females that were really well matched in terms of body weight and age, and um, then we measured them, cleaned them, and measured them. And one of the things is that they're very much the same size, and so that no single linear measurement really would distinguish them because there's small ones and big ones, and there's a lot of overlap. The only thing that, di that is different are ratios of the bones of, in this case, the upper, uh, the humerus and the femur, the upper limb and the lower limb. And so that, but in order to discover that, you have to have the whole skeletons and you have to have a sample. And that's a way you can discover that. Okay, so I was really excited. I did that research in the 70s. I couldn't wait to see what the uh, soft tissue showed. And they're the same. They're the same in body composition. They're the same in body proportions. There's some subtle differences. But I was a little disappointed that not big differences showed up, expecting, knowing that they are different. Um, but with a sample, things might be a little different. Uh, the other interesting lesson about the uh, anatomy is um, comparing male and female. And the linear dimensions, I don't know if you can read any of those numbers, take my word for it, they're almost literally the same one millimeter apart for a lot of them. Um, and so there's nothing that's different about the bones and even the skulls and very almost nothing about the dentition either. However, when we compare, in this case, a male, look at the size difference between the male and the female, 53 versus 37 kilo, and the limb masses differ, and the way it differs is that the males have these much heavier forelimbs and slightly heavier hind limbs. So again, that's, they pack so much mass on those little bones that it's really, truly amazing. So if we summarize just a few things of um, what we found out about the apes, is that we'll start with the males, that their body, in body composition, we have found that in general, males have more muscle. Uh, in body proportions, they have uh, greater forelimb mass and chest circumference. Just upper body is not just in men and women. This is really part of our ape relatives as well. And they have a longer growth period. They, after, uh, even after their teeth are all erupted and their bones are all fused, they bulk up and add body weight, but mainly muscle. And these male features. The females have a slightly less muscle, although they're very well muscled, less and more body fat. They reach maturity earlier. Their bones fuse, teeth erupt, and their adult body weight, they're ready to start reproducing. Uh, and what's interesting then is that the females are the baseline of the species and male anatomy and features are add-ons that come later in their development. Uh, and ladies, I just want to point out to you that because the brain uh, matures, uh, brain size is reached at an earlier age than body weight, is that us ladies have a slightly larger brain to body weight ratio. So we can interpret that a lot of different ways. <laughs> now, one of the things that's interesting about chimpanzees from the point of view of evolution is that what 
in a way, chimpanzees, one of the ways that we look at it is that they really expand on ape behaviors. And in this way, they give us clues about early human evolution. And I want to emphasize that they are expanding on ape behaviors because we think of chimpanzees and their uh, tool using as being so unique, but I'm going to tell you how they're building on, on the other apes. So the ways that chimpanzees differ from the other apes is that they are the most versatile in terms of locomotion with bipedal locomotion being a normal part of their repertoire. They expand their food items. They eat a lot more animal protein, a lot of insects. They are, all eat honey that they love and other kinds of, of, um, of foods. In terms of manipulative skills, one of the things about apes is how manipulative they are. And, and if you think about a couple of things, if you're living your life in trees and you have to make your way through the trees, you really understand branches. You understand the strength, the flexibility, the pliability of those branches. And so that you're not falling out of trees all the time. So, in, so the apes are so good in the trees and they really know the materials. They also uh, hand feed, they pluck their food. The gorillas use these elaborate manual kinds of, of motions to avoid all the thorns and thistles of the foods that they eat. Um, and then they all build nests every night. And so they really, these are really comfortable. Jane Goodall tested it out. They're really comfortable nests, and they are really good at manipulating all that vegetation. So they understand materials. They understand uh, how to manipulate them of all the apes. And what the chimpanzees have done have taken that a little further. And it's, we think of their signature as tool users, but what they're doing is really showing us how well they use their materials and how well they problem solve. They, they take it a little bit further. So just in terms of locomotion, they feed a lot in the trees. This is a typical kind of feeding posture. Of, you hang on with your feet and you reach out with your arms uh, to get new, in this case, new leaves. Um, so this is a, uh, one of the Gambi chimpanzee pictures I took. And here's another one. I love this one with the mother. Uh, carrying uh, her, in, her infant hanging on for dear life as she's stuffing herself with bananas. But if you, can see the, if you can see her foot, one of the things I want to call your attention to is the fact that chimpanzees and gorillas are unique among primates because they have a more uh, foot that's more stable. They go heel down and toe off. This is uh, for really spending more time on a flat surface. So this is their ground... Uh, element of their ground adaptation element of their uh, anatomy. And I always like this one that was taken some time ago by Patrick Neary. Neary. Again, look at the feet, but look at that balance of uh, this. This is Kevin. This was a, one of the young male chimpanzees at the time that was at the San Diego Zoo. So uh, chimpanzees spend more time on the ground uh, they go farther, uh, travel farther um, in terms of distance than any of the others, so that their, their whole versatility of their locomotion is really... Uh, and because they're bipedal, it kind of goes in the direction of humans. So we're pretty interested in their anatomy and locomotor behavior. In terms of the manipulation, they've invented all kinds of things, pestles to uh, gain uh, uh, the pulp in palm, palm trees. This has been... Uh, observed an invention, actually, that was, uh, occurred in population in Guinea. One of the more recent ones is the fashioning of a centimeter, 70 long centimeters to fray the end and make it into a point and then go spear little animals hiding out in tree hollows. Um, honey, to, uh, they love honey and they get it either on the ground or bees living in trees or on the ground. And uh, hard-shelled nuts using stone hammers, uh, hammers and anvils to crack open nuts. Now, one of the things that I just wanted to briefly mention is their different uh, limb posture, uh, hand postures in using uh, using uh, different positions and different kinds of implements. 
uh, that has been studied by Linda Marshan and Mary Marsky, actually filming uh, how they really use uh, and manipulate some of these um, things that they use. So you don't have to be a biped. We used to think, oh, you had to be biped, uh, stand on two legs and then use tools. But in fact, the chimpanzees are pretty, uh, already pretty accomplished, and this is only a tiny fraction of what they do with objects. I mean, they're incredibly innovative. Uh, in, but we're interested in how they could get food, and in some cases it makes a difference in terms of their diet, the fact that they can expand using tools to get new kinds of things. And more recently, there's been a number of papers written about their tool sets, and it turns out it's more common than we thought. So here's an example of two tools being used to get at ground termites. And so the selection of, of the tools is not just any old stem of any old plant. It has to be the right, exactly the right tool of the right plant. Uh, and then she, uh, the chimpanzee uh, takes off the leaves and gets it all ready and then carries it to the site, finds another more robust tool that she then probes into the termite hill and then uses the little termite wand, they call it, to get at the termites. And I will say, again, ladies, that the most adept tool users in the stone hammers and in uh, Jane Goodall's termiting, they've actually now studied this with video, it's really the females that are the star tool users. And they uh, have also found that the, how the infants learn from watching their mother, and you can see that depicted here too. So um, the bipedal, the anatomy of chimpanzees that helps us understand how uh, that bipedal element of their behavior and how that might impact early human locomotion is that chimpanzees have the most muscular lower limbs, as you saw on that earlier slide. They have a foot structure that's already adapted for work, walking on ground surfaces, although they've retained their ability to climb trees. And they have long lower limbs relative to the upper limb and to the trunk. Oh, these are all anatomical features that you can see how that could help us transition to understanding the early bipeds. So a couple of points I wanted to emphasize. One is that chimpanzees are not human ancestors, but we have shared a very close common ancestor in the last four to five million years. Uh, and it must have been anatomy like a Central African ape and probably one of moderate size like a chimpanzee. So chimpanzees are a pretty good guide. And I would argue that we can, it's really a small step to become a full-time biped, a full-time early human, given this kind of anatomy and the kind of potential. And sure enough, we have uh, the Lytoli footprints uh, from Tanzania that are 3.7 million years, and they're actually the prints, it's the only kind of soft anatomy that we have in the fossil record. Um, we also have, of course, the famous Lucy skeleton that gives us proportions, at least in terms of the forelimb and hindlimb. And you'll notice that in the, uh, the far right is a tibia from um, Kenya that is uh, 4.2 million years and is definitely like a human tibia. In other words, one that has much less rotation compared to a chimpanzee, so we know that this is really good evidence that this individual was a biped. Then what we see, if you look at all of the little um, red dots of the sites that go um, from central to north and south Africa in the Great Rift Valley and even over to Chad, that, uh, that these sites are between four and a little bit less than three million years. And what we have is evidence for bipedal australopiths, which are the, the name that we call these early human fossils. So in my working hypothesis is that being a biped and living in this new environment 
moving into the eastern part of the continent was so successful that it evolved very rapidly. And in this period of time, we have at least 10 species and probably more, uh, depending on how you count it. But you can see the widespread distribution and how in a very short period of time that we got all these bipeds. The foot, uh, going back to the footprint, you see in the middle uh, a, a study done uh, measuring the depth and everything, and it's very close to human with some interesting differences, slightly more weight borne on the outside of the foot, um, but you can see the definite resemblance. And here's where having uh, human anatomy and chimpanzee anatomy uh, that gives us some clues about how we can look at the fossils. So um, you see here that the amount of bone, if we look, do an analysis of the tissue of the foot, you see that the human foot has much less muscles than the chimpanzee, but much more skin and fat. You know, it's a nice flat surface for bearing weight. Um, and definitely for a flat surface as opposed to a chimpanzee. And we speculated about how we would portion out those tissues for uh, the fossil, because it has to be somewhere in between, so it probably had less muscle than the chimp, but more than human, and so on. Uh, and similarly, with some of the other parts of the anatomy, if we look at uh, the pelvis, lower limbs, and think about Lucy and proportions, is that what we see with the early human in the middle, the Australopith, is the forelimbs are lighter, start being lighter and shorter, and the hind limbs, the lower limbs, longer. And so we can think about uh, relative mass. But one, and another really good study here that I particularly like is if you look at the way muscle is distributed, and you saw a version of this earlier, is you see what happens for us to become really good bipeds is that we have to lose a lot of muscle, and a lot of mass, of which muscle is an important part, uh, in the upper body, but we're gaining a lot of muscle in our, our hip and thigh. And so we can use these kinds of measurements to really understand what some of the changes might have been during human evolution. And so um, I'm going to close with uh, this wonderful panorama. Carol has painted these as in watercolors, and I forgot to that mention earlier, but all of the artwork uh, is Carol's, and uh, most of it is in our book. But I wanted to just end on a word on basic research. Because when I started um, doing uh, anatomy, it was really out of curiosity. I was interested in how the two species of chimp would look if you put muscle and skin and everything on their bones, because I'd studied the skeleton so much. I was interested in male and female, and how can you get um, males being identical in the bones and be so different in body mass, you know, what's going on? So those kinds of questions led me to really be interested in, especially in chimpanzees, but then gorillas came along into my life, into our life, because a lot of people here in the audience were involved in those early dissections of these enormous creatures that we love so much. Um, but you just don't know where basic research is going to get you. It's very important to have the curiosity to do the basic research. You just never know uh, what, how it's going to lead. So I was really surprised when I got a, a, a message on my answering machine. This was the day before cell phones. And it was a call from a guy named Tone Tyne from Disney. He said, hi, this is Tone Tyne. Uh, I got your name from the Smithsonian. I understand that you know about gorillas. And we're working on our Tarzan movie. <laughs> and uh, they had talked to Jane Goodall, and she was very disappointed that they decided not to model it on chimpanzees. Uh, but they were going to model it on gorillas. Uh, so some of you, if you go out and rent it, it's a really great movie. Now... <laughs> So uh, I talked to, to Tone, and uh, we set up an all-day workshop for 15 animators. 
and most of them were working on the Tarzan film, but there were a couple that were working on some dinosaur uh, movies, but they wanted to understand, you know, the, the, um, the bones and the muscles and so forth. So we had an interesting time, and um, a couple of people here in the audience were there. Um, and so we started with a lecture, you know, but um, my husband was sitting in the back and he was saying, you know, and if you look closely, you see colored pencils. They didn't take notes. They did little drawings. That's not the way they did it. So we took them around. We spent a lot of time comparing gorillas compared to other species in terms of, of hands and feet and, of course, the animators, everything. They wanted to fit everything together. We talked to them about behavior because really why we want to know about the anatomy also is we want to understand their behavior, uh, particularly of the fossils too. Now, it just so happened that we had just received a, uh, another silverback gorilla about, oh, I don't know, it was a, a two or three weeks before this workshop and we had actually started uh, dissecting it and um, so I said, you know, you can come into the lab and, you know, you can look and see what we've done. And no, 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 they didn't want to come in. Oh, a couple of them decided we couldn't get them out of the lab. They had so much fun. And one of the things that particularly interested them was Congo's hands. So they were not only looking at how their hands compared, but the tendons were dissected so they could pull on the tendons and the hands would do different things. They were completely fascinated with that. And that was why I thought that maybe why they, they really paid attention to Tarzan's hands. Because, and I really think it was Congo that was in there somewhere uh, that uh, was channeling them. Uh, and a year later, we went down to Burbank and saw Tone again. He was uh, showing us that he'd saved his name tag. Um, to see how the animators were doing, and it was really fascinating how they were putting it all together with the voices and so on. So that was really uh, a wonderful experience, and of course, um, the animators really had a good time and <laughs> thanked me. And I think that they, I think that this was Mickey's grandfather because I just read in the New York Times that Mickey is 90 years old and still going strong, so never can tell. And so Adrian says thanks to all the wonderful students at UCSC and Cabrillo, my esteemed colleagues and collaborators, vets, personnel that have made it possible, and the university, of course, for the facilities, and ma mainly the apes themselves who have helped us understand our evolution. Thank you.